announce the unsealing of a federal complaint against James Reardon, age 20, of New Middletown, Ohio. He is charged with one count of making threats using a facility of interstate commerce. Now, federal rules give us a few weeks before seeking an indictment in the grand jury, and we will continue to use that time to further our investigation of Mr. Reardon's conduct and to determine if others were involved. In just a moment, Special Agent Eric Smith of the FBI will detail the facts uncovered in our investigation thus far. I want to start by thanking the community. This case is the result of a concerned citizen who took the time to point out Mr. Reardon's social media activity to a new Middletown police officer. This case is just one over the past several weeks that are the product of our friends and neighbors seeing something and then saying something. For example, a few weeks ago, a man named Timothy Ireland was indicted on firearms and threat charges after a private citizen alerted law enforcement. And at the beginning of this month, Vincent Armstrong pleaded guilty to charges related to planning an attack on a bar in Toledo. That case started with a tip from a concerned citizen to Toledo police. There are several more examples, and they illustrate the fact that these type of cases rely on two very important people, a concerned citizen and a responsive law enforcement officer. And fortunately, we have both in abundance in Northern Ohio. I want to thank the men and women who make up our police departments, and obviously some of their leadership is here today. As I said, tips only matter if police officers take them seriously and investigate them thoroughly. The presence of our local law enforcement here today highlights the message that police officers are trained to be responsive to information from the public and the officers assigned to these departments and many others will do just that when confronted with credible and specific threats. And I also want to thank the FBI and ATF agents who join with the police in each of these cases and bring outstanding expertise to these investigations. Now let me speak generally to those who are advocates for white supremacy or white nationalism. I am talking directly to you. The Constitution protects your right to speak, your right to think, and your right to believe. If you want to waste the blessings of liberty by going down a path of hatred and failed ideologies, that is your choice. Democracy allows you to test those ideas in a public forum. If you want to submit your beliefs to the American people and get their reaction, please be our guest. Keep this in mind, though. Thousands and thousands of young Americans already voted with their lives to ensure that this same message of intolerance, death, and destruction would not prevail. You can count their ballots by visiting any American cemetery in North Africa, Italy, France, or Belgium, and tallying the white headstones. You can also recite the many names of civil rights ad advocates who bled and died in opposing supporters of those same ideologies of hatred. Their voices may be distant, but they can still be heard. So go ahead and make your case for Nazism, a white nation, and racial superiority. The Constitution may give you a voice, but it doesn't guarantee you a receptive audience. Your right to free speech does not automatically mean that people will agree with you. In fact, you have a God-given and inalienable right to be on the losing end of this argument. What you don't have, though, is the right to take out your frustration at failure in the political arena by resorting to violence. You don't have any right to threaten the lives and well-being of our neighbors. They have an absolute and God-given and inalienable right to live peacefully, to worship as they please, to be, fear, to be free from fear that they may become a target simply because of the color of their skin, the country of their birth, or the form of their prayer. Threatening to kill Jewish people, gunning down innocent Latinos on a weekend shopping trip, planning and plotting to perpetrate murders in the name of a nonsense racial theory, sitting to pray with God-fearing people who you execute moments later, those actions don't make you soldiers, they make you cowards. And law enforcement does not go to war with cowards who break the law. We arrest them and send them to prison. As I said, this case was made by a concerned member of the public and a responsive police officer. That's all it takes to stop you. The men and women of our community are allied with law enforcement. And every single member of law enforcement took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And many of us have taken that oath several times, as police officers, as federal agents, as prosecutors, as military members, as elected officials. Together, we represent the best of what America has to offer. Our skin is every color you can imagine. Our families come from 100 different countries and 100 different faiths. What makes us different doesn't split us apart, though. 
Those differences are insignificant compared to what is the same about us. We are united in our commitment to each other, our families, and our communities. We are the living embodiment of everything you say is impossible. Together, we are united to ensure that you commit no further acts of violence in the name of your beliefs. When you wake up tomorrow morning, no matter what time that is, I want you to remember something. You can't set your alarm clock early enough to beat us out of bed. The men and women of law enforcement don't wake up. We never go to sleep. We are always awake. And arm in arm with the public, when your hatred leads you to break the law, we will do everything we can to be there to stop you. I'll now turn it over to Special Agent Eric Smith of the FBI to detail some facts relating to this investigation. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Eric Smith. I am the Special Agent in Charge of the Cleveland Division of the FBI. Uh, many of you are already familiar with the facts surrounding the case, so uh, let me just review the information as it is articulated in the federal complaint. On August 16, 2019, a new Middletown police officer was made aware of a video posted on July 11th by a user named Ira Seamus. Later that day, the Youngstown Resident Agency of the FBI received a phone call from Police Chief Vince DiGidio relaying the information received. Details provided by the Chief and a review of the video depicted James P. Reardon holding an assault rifle and Reardon stating at the beginning of the video, F expletive a life. He then held the rifle in multiple firing positions with audio of gunshots and sound effects of sirens and people screaming added into the background of the video. The video also had a caption which stated in part, the police identified the Youngstown Jewish family community shooter as local white nationalist Seamus O'Riordan. The video was also tagged at the Jewish Community Center of Youngstown. Immediate action by our local partners resulted in a local search warrant for Reardon's residence. In addition to the search warrant, a local arrest warrant for Reardon on the charges of aggravated menacing and telecommunications harassment was obtained. On that same evening of August 16th, New Middletown and Springfield Township police officers, along with members of the FBI's Mahoning Valley Violent Crimes Task Force, executed the search warrant and the arrest warrant for James Reardon. An AR-15 assault rifle, an MP-40 submachine gun, numerous Nazi World War II propaganda posters, a rifle bayonet, a Hitler youth knife, and vintage U.S. military equipment were observed in the residence. Many of these items had been utilized in the posted video we just mentioned. Reardon was not present at the time of the search, but upon his return to the residence, he was placed into local custody without incident. Reardon has remained in local custody since his arrest. On August 19th, the federal complaint for transmitting threatening communications via interstate commerce was filed under seal. The complaint was unsealed this morning, and Reardon has been transferred to federal custody. He will have his initial appearance in federal court later today on those charges. Now, the FBI will take this opportunity to remind the public to report suspicious behavior or suspicious postings that are observed online, particularly those involving threats. No amount of information is too small for law enforcement to address. If you see something, please say something. As ever, collaboration between local, state, and federal law enforcement will immediately address the threats we identify and those the public brings to our attention. All too often, subsequent investigation into mass shootings reveal individuals that knew the shooter were aware of his or her revealing threatening statements or that the postings the perpetrator had previously made were, on their own, concerning. We need people to come forward with just this kind of information. Innocent lives, maybe people you know, maybe your life is at stake. We must be made aware of these threats and law enforcement will act quickly. Thank you. And I'll be followed by Chief DeJenny. Well, thank you, everybody, and especially want to thank the U.S. Attorney's Office and our local FBI when we were made aware of this local situation. Understand, New Middletown isn't Cleveland. We are a 
village in New Middletown in Mahoning County, a suburb of Youngstown. Our population is 1,700. We have three full-time police officers and four part-time police officers. So for this to come about where everybody always says it'll never happen in a small town, it happens in a small town. It doesn't have to happen in a big city. Um, my officer was on an unrelated call for a, a elderly female in distress when he was approached by a concerned citizen, a previous friend of Reardon's, who said she was very disturbed by videos that he was posting on Instagram. He recorded that video, called me at home, came to my house, we looked at it, and then we implemented our action plan of <laughs> the two of us investigating this quickly at our station and notifying the local FBI. Um, Agent Speaks from the FBI came to our location with the Violent Crimes Task Force. They viewed all the information. We were able to turn, obtain arrest warrants from Struthers Municipal Court, who on a fri late Friday evening was exceptional at the prosecutor calling everybody in and eventually calling the judge in for the search warrant at 10 o'clock at night. It was in that the search warrant was um, implemented at about 10.30 that evening at the residence, a very quiet residential neighborhood in New Middletown Village. Um, Reardon wasn't home, but his mom was home and contact was made with her. The search warrant was executed and the officers and the FBI located the, the weapons that were described and the propaganda that was described. A couple minutes later, while I was standing outside, a car pulled up and it was Reardon driving it and we took him into custody without incident. Um, so at this point in time, our, our biggest thanks is to the citizen who came forward. You know, the adage of if you see something, say something, this, this rang true 100% on this instance. Um, we prevented, hopefully, a tragedy. At the time we were notified, we made all our notifications of Youngstown Police Department, who have this jurisdiction over the Jewish Community Center in Youngstown. Let their officers know. We let the security task force at the Jewish Community Center know, and they put their implementation plan in operation. So everything went perfect, basically, by the book. Uh, it, this couldn't have been written any better law enforcement wise, not for Mr. Reardon. So at this point in time, when we're, we're grateful and we just want to stress, you know what, whether it's New Middletown, whether it's Youngstown, whether it's Cleveland, whether it's any of these agencies, um, people have bad ideas in their mind. When you know about that, let somebody know. Remain confidential, call a crime tip line, call whoever, just but make somebody know, whether it be local law enforcement or the FBI. Um, our federal associates were, were phenomenal in helping us out. This is the part of the largest things that ever happened in New Middletown. And I knew this gentleman. I watched him grow up as a child. And I know his mother, the divorced family. So we're working with, with her also and keeping her in our thoughts and prayers because this is devastating to her also, not knowing this. Uh, Mr. Reardon has a storied past apparently with white nationalism. And that all came to fruition when we you know, watched videos of him in the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally a couple years ago when he expressed his uh, white nationalism ideas and his ideologies. So you never know where it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, but please, we take these threats very, very seriously. We have to. And like the FBI and the U.S. Attorney mentioned, it's always after the fact when there's a tragedy and the back investigation starts that somebody always says, oh yeah, I knew about this a month ago, I knew about this two months ago. He's always had this activity in his mind, he's always talked about this, but I didn't want to come forward and make him a suspect. If had that not happened, this, this video he posted on Instagram was so real. Um, and when it pinpointed specifically the Youngstown Jewish Community Center, you know, at that point in time we had to take a, a very, very quick, quick action. The initial complaint came in about four o'clock by 10.45, 11 o'clock, Mr. Reardon was in custody and in the Mahoney County Jail. So that's how quickly evolving this was in our community, and hopefully that's how quickly evolving to be in other communities once the information is brought forward. So I'll answer any questions anybody may have or... Do you know what federal court and what time we can get you that information? I don't, I don't know if we have it yet, but uh, we can make sure that you have that. Thanks, Jim. Welcome. Oh, it, it, he's already appeared? Okay, there you go. So he's already appeared at 9.30. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? What makes it? I know there are different statutes, but can you talk a little bit about what makes this difference in, say, a, uh, in terms of an investigation, in terms of a terrorism case, what you think of the existing terrorism case? 
what makes it different than a standard what terrorism case? Uh, well, it's like any investigation. There are certain steps that we have to take, whether it's a terrorism investigation or, or a drug investigation, right? You've got you to make sure that you have um, identified the appropriate network of, subs, of suspects. You've identified uh, locations or items that you want to investigate further and uh, obtain search warrants for those. Uh, you want to make sure that you've talked to people who know the targets of the investigation, that you've interviewed witnesses. Um, and uh, at a certain point in time, uh, like with any investigation, again, but, but since you brought up terrorism, it's, it, I think it's fitting, you have to make a decision about when to act. And fortunately, in this case, local law enforcement was in a position to act very quickly uh, within, within five hours, as the chief mentioned. Can you talk yes. A, a little bit. My name is Afis Rasan with WCPN. Chief, could you talk a little bit about what was on the video that made it? Well, one of the things was when that video came to my um, surprise, um, it showed him firing a semi-automatic assault rifle with, it, it seems like, uh, special effects for screaming and sirens. And the verbiage that was placed in there, the profanity about F a life and then some other information, we couldn't even die, hear some of it because of the gunfire. But the tagline that was associated with that, it, it looked like a future headline that he had posted where it said, police identify um, Youngstown Jewish Family Center shooter as white local nationalist. That seemed like he was projecting something. There was something maybe in the works. Um, that's what kept us going right there because it identified a specific threat and what was on the video and subsequent Instagram videos that our law enforcement officers and the FBI were able to look at along with our prosecutor in Struthers Court. And that's what justified charges of the telephone communications harassment and the aggravated menacing because there was a specific threat identified. How many videos did you actually see? Because you said subsequent. Um, there were about six videos on the Instagram account. And currently the FBI is in the process of um, checking his cell phone and things along that nature for additional information. We, that was all turned over to the FBI. Uh, we're always looking at other people if we have to expand the investigation, but at this time, all that information has been turned over to our local FBI office for additional follow-up. So because it's all in, in progress in investigation, there can be no other information um, released on that, that aspect of it. But we always, we always are looking at everybody else. Um, after talking to some other people that, you know, came forward after the fact, they said that during high school he scared them, um, things along that nature. He had some, some ideologies that weren't within society norms. And, but instead of going to somebody and talking to somebody, a guidance counselor or, you know, an adult, respected adult in the, in the school system, this was all held to themselves. Uh, and like I said, once this broke, you know, then more people came forward and said, hey, this guy in high school is this, this guy in high school is that you know, information of, hey, he burnt animals, you know, and videoed them, you know, and, you know, which, which animal abuse is, you know, a precursor for domestic violence that, you know, lead, just leads on to a criminal activity in life. He had his possession in MP40. Is that an illegal firearm? And if so, how did he obtain that? Um, it looks like uh, a German assault weapon. It is legal to have. Um, he's a self-proclaimed collector of World War II weapons. Whether he he had it or it's another family members we're still waiting with the F ATF to run the backgrounds on those weapons um, those are currently in custody and won't be released did he have a criminal record at all Sorry. no no criminal record um, as a juvenile we just had him for some criminal mischief very minor criminal mischief mm -hmm. vandalisms with you know amongst friends and, and stuff like that but otherwise he was <coughs> always below the radar and um, at the night of his arrest he was very nonchalant very complacent and just said hey chief uh, sorry no, it was it was basically a breaking up with a uh, buddy over a girl, things along that nature, overturning potted plants in their yard, some minor vandalism like that, but nothing that would signify, you know, what his current ideology was of being a white nationalist. Did the family have any concerns about it happening to the weapons? Since he said it was a self 
You know, mom said that when I, when I talked to her, mom said that uh, years ago she had some concerns, but she thought he was out of that and that he had straightened up. Um, he was he was working at a pizza shop in the Boardman area or the Poland area, and she thought that he had straightened up and got rid of all that stuff. But once she was shown the, the one video that prompted everything, then you know she 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 just broke down. It was it was sad. So she never went into her bedroom. And actually well, they had stuff. Well, they had stuff in the basement, um, postings and things along that nature. But a lot of it was World War II, you know, banners and different things like that, um, some Nazi stuff. But it was down around the bar area that um, over the years they've collected and just posted, just like, you know, you'd collect uh, sports pennants and stuff like that. Like I said, he, he's a self-proclaimed historian of World War II and things along that nature. Was the video shot in that uh, the video was shot somewhere at a gun range, it looks like. Um, we haven't identified that yet, but it is tagged at the Jewish Community Center. So uh, the assumption is that it actually occurred somewhere near at or near the Jewish Community Center in the city of Youngstown. Have you spoken to the Community Center? What have they told you? They doing? Um, they're doing well. They had a press conference about two weeks ago. Um, they're ex they were very ecstatic about how the system actually worked. Uh, the very quick notification from our department to the Youngstown Police Department and to the Jewish Community Center's security force. They brought in additional uniformed officers for all their, there's like seven or six or seven facilities in Mahoning and Trumbull County. They have additional officers stationed there for the next couple of weeks just to ease everybody's um, concerns. Um, they were very thankful, they were very thankful to our local law enforcement, to the, to the FBI, you know, for the, the quick and rapid response, you know, hopefully preventing a tragedy. Um, the phone calls we got was this, you know, in relation to the Tree of Life uh, Pittsburgh synagogue shootings a year or so ago. And, you know, at, at that point, we didn't think about it. We were just thinking about, you know, we need to get this guy off the road. You know, we need to get him in custody and recover whatever weapons we can. Are you thankful for the fact that everybody works together so well, especially, you know, especially like with state, local, and federal? You know, absolutely. Being a small town, you know, we're, we're not – that much uh, acclimated to what the FBI does a lot of times, stuff like that. We do brief, you know, regularly with them, our local FBI in Youngstown at trainings and things along that nature. And, you know, small towns, everybody's got an ego, you know, this police department bumps over this police department. But it, it was such a seamless effort notifying the Cleveland FBI, putting us in touch with the on-call uh, special agents in the city, and then having them call us and then come out, you know, with the, with the resources available that we don't have and we rely on the task force of the FBI and the Violent Crimes Task Force to help us out in these situations. It was phenomenal. Um, the whole thing went seamless. No officers were injured. No persons were injured. Mr. Reardon wasn't injured. So it, it was it was like the perfect scenario for a situation like this that was developed, investigated, and charged, and incarcerated. Chief, this may be a question for you, probably everybody standing up there, alternative heads above the people standing. <laughs> um, no, um, you know, this ended up coming in. You know, that, that incident in Boardman where that, that, that young man threatened the lives of federal officers, um, I think that's in everybody's mind, but this was a totally unrelated. Uh, when the young person approached the officer, they were just like, you know, this guy keeps having contact with me. I don't want him to have contact with me. Here's the kind of stuff that he's posting. It's very scary. I'm concerned about this. You know, the, the police need to know this, and you guys go from there. Um, did she think it was going to rapidly evolve like that? That I think it was going to rapidly evolve like that? Absolutely not. But you know what? I was just like so so glad that she came forward and provided the information to the, to my officer, and then he contacted me, and then we spent all of Friday evening, you know, investigating this along with our our counterparts with the the FBI. Just just for my clarification, the person who came forward, she was a friend of the suspect, or yeah, she was a uh, previous friend. That he kept um, bothering. Okay, so she was in his age group. Yes, <clears throat> yes, and um, you know, and, and that comes back to the adage, you know, hey, if you see something, say something. If you become aware of something, please, please tell somebody. You know, let's avert any type of tragedies, things along that nature. We just have to be there. You know, have confidence in your local police departments. That's what we're here to serve you for. 
you know, put the onus on us to investigate and, and go from there. We would rather you call us and we investigate it and it, it proves fruitless, but it's going to be investigated thoroughly, then you don't call us and it's not investigated and then hence we have a mass shooting situation. Um, one person killed during hate crimes or during anything like that is, is one too many. So we just need everybody, the public, please, please cooperate with law enforcement, cooperate with the FBI, and then we'll, we'll have a safer communities all around. Springfield Local High School. On our charges, um, what, what we did, we met with the FBI um, that night. We sent all the images to the FBI, and then they would, said they would investigate it further, and they would contact the U.S. Attorney's Office, so hence this gentleman can address that issue. Yeah, it's, and, and, and it's uh, very similar to what we've seen in a number of these other threat situations, which is it almost always starts with a local arrest, some sort of local charge. Uh, and then we have to analyze the facts and look at our federal statutes to determine whether or not we've got a violation of federal law. Um, that's basically the process, and that can happen very rapidly. Uh, could, it could take a little bit of time, um, but in, in this case, uh, it, it moved on the, on the quicker side. We were able to move pretty quickly. Did you address sentencing? I'm sorry, that No, uh, we have not addressed that yet. Um, so he's currently just charged with a complaint, um, uh, which is uh, – Establishing probable cause that he's committed uh, making a threat to interstate of uh, using a facility of interstate commerce, um, and the sentence obviously would be up to a judge to determine. But there are, you know, there's always the possibility of additional charges once we seek an indictment. So this is not the final version of what uh, the charge sheet for Mr. Reardon may look like. Is he being held in federal? He was. He wasn't. He was in local custody. He was taken out of local custody this morning and um, presented to a federal magistrate. Based on his current charges, what kind of punishment? Could you know, that's, it, it, it's, it, it, I know this is an unsatisfactory answer for you, but it's dependent on a lot of different things, and it would be inappropriate for me to weigh in on that at this point in time because there's so much uh, that would have to go into what a potential sentence would be, and that's ultimately up to a federal judge to determine that. And he's imported That's what I'm told, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. That's what I thought. He'll be, I, I think it's going to be this afternoon, but I don't know if. I believe it's going to be in Youngstown, but Dave, do you have an answer for that? I don't think it'll be today. The last time okay. I had contact with the court would be sometime within the next week to ten days. Okay. And that should be documented today, I think. That's our assistant U.S. attorney Dave Tepfer is handling the case. Was there a reason it was sealed for a week and a half? There's a reason. I'm not gonna get into why that was though. It's, there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons for it actually, but um, we felt this was an appropriate time to unseal it, uh, and to make our federal interest in the case known. Uh, I'm not going to comment on ongoing investigations or what, uh, whatever else we might be doing. Um, suffice to say that, you know, this, this kind of case definitely focuses our attention in a particular area or particular people, and we're always trying to figure out if there's a broader network that's in play. And our investigation is still ongoing, as I said at the outset. Did the Post get a lot of reaction, like likes or comments or something like that? Can I have your thoughts on it? Uh, I don't actually know the answer to that. Do you, do you know um, that, Chief? Initially, there were like 70 uh, likes on that. But then um, after the information got um, released and before the site was taken down, it was up to about 4,000. So people were looking at it, you know, and things along that nature, which is, you know, sad. People just, you know, natural uh, curiosity probably wanted to see it, um, especially when it's coming from a small community and a lot of them probably are friends of his or former acquaintances. So the site's been taken down is, um, at this point in time, and we do have that secured. Was this his personal account or was it a fake account? No, it was his personal account. I think we maybe have time for one more question if there's anything else. No? Okay, we wore you guys out. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it, and uh, take care. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.